Welcome to the Bronx Hip Hop Oral History Project. Today is Wednesday, August 28, 2024. I am Pastor Crespo Jr., the research librarian and archivist for the Bronx County Historical Society. Today, I am joined by Chino Action Lopez, also known as Edwin Chino Lopez, a dancer, pioneering b-boy, a member of the Floor Masters, and then the New York City Breakers. Welcome, Action. Thanks for having me, brother. Uh, glad to have you here. Uh, I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy day just to come here so that we can record b-boy history, hip-hop history, from not just those that were there, but those that participate. You That's know? why I'm here, brother. Awesome, awesome. We like to start out all our interviews by finding out who you are, where you come from. Could you tell us a little bit about each of your parents and where they come from? Well, both my parents were born in Puerto Rico in Ponce, you know. Um, I'm 100% Puerto Rican and proud of it, you know. Um, I got uh, two brothers and a sister. You know, um, just like everyone else that grew up in, in the South Bronx, it was a little rough, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. My, mo my mother and my father, they did the best that they could, you know. Eventually, um, being born in Brooklyn originally, and uh, Brooklyn Hospital actually, the original Brooklyn Hospital that burned down. Okay. Yeah, then they rebuilt it, my mother told me. And then moving to Red Hook where I was raised, I was there for a couple of years, uh, to about seven, eight years old. All right. And then my mother and father ended up getting divorced. So my mother didn't want to be in Brooklyn anymore. She was surrounded by like her family, uh, his family. She wanted to get away, so she moved us to the Bronx, 155th and Melrose. Right off of Third Avenue. That changed my life right there. Wow. Wow. So be before we move on, did, did your mother ever tell you stories about Puerto Rico, the memory she had and where she from? In oh, constantly, constantly. And not only that, like in my house, we spoke predominantly Spanish. Oh, wow. It was always Spanish. You know, uh, when we walked in the house and even leaving the house, it was always bendición. You cannot leave the house without saying bendición because my mother always said, you know, this might be the last time you see me. It might be the last time I see you, God forbid. Right. So always with a blessing. Right. Know? But um, And for the viewers out there, La Bendición is you asking your parents or an elder for their blessing. Before you leave. Exactly. Right? Yes. You know. So um, the only time that we spoke English, English was in school, you know. But again, being in my family's house, being at home, it was predominantly Spanish right. all the time. Yeah. Did, did your father ever tell you why they moved, you know, from Puerto Rico to New York, you know? To for a better life, you know. My father was a hard worker. He worked in a shoe factory, you know, um, made shoes by hand, you know. And I was proud of that. You know, it says it on my birth certificate. It's crazy. Shoemaker. Sweet. <laughs> my mother was a stay-at-home stay, stay mom. She's the oldest out of 13. Wow. So my mother was a mother five six seven years old she was already taking care of her brothers and sisters yeah so again yeah um i i think moving to uh new york it, they, they wanted a better life right uh, more opportunity especially for us got it got it how many brothers and sisters do you have i have two brothers and one sister all right yeah. great great mm -hmm. and you told us where in the bronx you you moved to when you were seven, eight years old. Mm -hmm. Now I want you to tell me what was the neighborhood like? You know, when when Action walked outside, what did he see? The people, what did you hear? What was going on? You know what I saw? Family. Like, everyone loved each other. We all got along. I, I don't remember. I mean, of course, you know, there was violence and stuff like that. But living on our block, we were protected. You know, like the kids, there was 20, 30 of us at one time running around playing uh, Skelzies, Johnny on the Pony, Sweet. you know, Ring Alivio, you know, Hot Piece and Butter, all the real kick the can. Right. You know, um, we were safe. I saw family. That's what I saw. And everybody took care of everybody. And like I was telling you before, that in my building, all the doors were open. Like I would go to my neighbor's house and eat do whatever I want. I was able to go in my friend's house, go in his refrigerator. Again, it was, we were all family, you know? So you're 60 years old now. Yes. Around seven or eight years old. What, what year was that you in the Bronx now? Oof. 
well, I was born in 65. So I want to say, what, 71? 73, 74. Oh, maybe around. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, which was a great time, man. I mean, again, it was... Dude, I remember they had a program where a truck would come full of food and they would give it to the people. Now, everybody would line up behind. It was, it was a uh, New York State program. Okay. It was for, uh, you know, the poor that wasn't able to afford food. Right. And... um. My mother would give me a bag, and you would go and stand in line. They would open the back of the truck, and they would ask you how many members in your family. And depending on how many, many members in your family, that's how many meals they gave you. And the meals consisted of like a ham and cheese sandwich, an apple, you know, maybe some vegetables. And it was all wrapped and sealed, you know. And this was all government food, you know. And I tell this story to people, and some people, a lot of people remember that are my age. They went through the same, because these government programs went all over the city, you know. But those are the things I remember, like doing, running outside, getting the meals for my family, bringing them inside, going outside, you know, having holes in the bottom of my sneakers, my mother cutting linoleum to put it in my shoe. Nice. <laughs> I haven't heard of that. Yes. Because we couldn't afford, you know, we couldn't afford another pair of shoes. I had to wait, you know. So, again, it was just family. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You know, and, and that's what we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to capture the lives of these b-boys and what you guys were going through and living when you guys came up you know and, and i tell and people innovated every, this beautiful dance i tell people every day pastor i wouldn't trade my childhood for nothing some people might look at it yeah the bronx was burning we were planning burnt buildings abandoned lots talk to us about that oh my god it was so adventurous i mean you you want an adventure try playing in a building where there's no floors you had to jump over a hole that was two or three stories, you know, a drop, you know. We would go around and collect old mattresses that were urinated on and stuff like that. We didn't even care just so we could start learning how to flip and doing gymnastics. And it, again, it was all of us. Like my mother and all, my, all the all the mothers, they thought we were crazy because <laughs> now we're doing aerials and stuff like that, and right, right. risking our lives. But we were. It was it was nothing but fun. I didn't see the tragedy. I didn't see the horror, you know? All I witnessed again was family and friends. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. What, being at home with your mom and, and your dad, what kind of music did they expose to you as a youth? Dude, my mother was no joke. I am so, that's another thing that I'm proud of. I remember my mother, we had a record store two blocks from my house on Melrose. It was right on, uh, right on Third Avenue. So we would walk down and there was a little record shop Every time you bought a record, you, I, was, I was a heavily martial artist since I was a kid. I come from a family of fighters. My father was a boxer. I had two uncles that were martial artists. We had our own dojo for a while. So I'm throwing kicks and stuff like that since I was five. One of my uncles had took me to see uh, Bruce Lee. When I saw that, that also changed my life. <laughs> so my mother would take us to the record store. And every time she bought a record, you got a free picture of Bruce Lee, a black and white picture of Bruce Lee. I remember going to buy so Samakusa. Like, these are the records, James Brown. These are the records that my mother was buying and playing. Now, my father was a little more still right. Puerto Rican with the salsa and merengue and the cumbia and everything, you know. But my mother was the one who kind of introduced that B-boy music to us. And hearing that, you know, Dennis Coffey, Scorpio, like all those old records that came out back then. And again, I, like, I, I, to this day, I have conversations with my mom. I'm like, mom, like... What made you buy those records? And she goes, that's what me and all my friends were listening to. All right. Yeah. All her friends. What was the community made up of? The ethnicities, races. What did you see? It was a mixture. Your mother to it me? was a mixture. We had black, white, uh, Hispanic, uh, Italian. Again, but we didn't see Oriental. Okay. But as kids, like I told you before, we didn't see any of that. I, I didn't see a black friend. I didn't see a white friend. He right. was just my friend. Right. You know, and we were all poor. You know, so it didn't matter. Like, you know, it, awesome. and also we never disrespected each other as far as calling each other names, you know, like disrespecting our cultures, or our religions and stuff like that. Because, again, to us, it didn't matter. We were just kids, you know. Right, yeah. right, right. What what kind of foods did you eat at home? What kind of was that? What was a typical oh, dinner? Fried chicken, rice, macaroni and cheese, spaghetti, everything that was bad. <laughs> everything that was bad. <laughs> But I also remember um, times where my mother would make us rice with eggs. And I loved it. To me, that was like a delicacy. 
Right. As I got older, I remember I was in my 20s, and I went to go visit my mom because I was living on my own already. And uh, I'm like, Mom, can you make me some rice and eggs? And she started to cry. And I'm like, <laughs> sorry. Nah, it's all right, man. <sighs> Those times were rough. Yeah. That really at home. <laughs> the things you remember, you know? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, man. And what, what our parents sacrifice and do yeah. for us is amazing. <clears throat> so I remember I told my mom, can you make me some rice and eggs? And she's like, okay. And she started to cry. And I'm like, mom, why are you crying? And she goes, you know, when I made you guys that, it's because I couldn't afford meat. And I'm like, I didn't know that. We were just having dinner. You know what I'm right. saying? Action before breaking, before intro being introduced to breaking. Do you recall any family gatherings and dances that that influenced you know your b-boy and dancing career? Well, I mean, there were a lot of great dances in my family. I mean, my mother was a salsera. You know, uh, dancing just was part of the culture. You know, always was. The music was part of the culture, so we were surrounded by that daily. And again, my mother buying those certain records again introducing me. To me, breakbeats, again, being so young and not even knowing where that was going to go in the future, it, 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 it was like synonymous and surreal, you know? But we were surrounded by talent. There were a lot of artists in my family who drew, who painted. You know, I also did that when I was young. Okay. My father also. But the music, the dancing, yeah, we were surrounded at that, by that all the time. Right. Yeah. Right. What, what middle school did you... Oh. Before that, what elementary school did you go to in the Bronx? I went to PS1 All right. in, uh, in the South Bronx. Then when my mother moved us uptown to, to Kingsbridge in uh, University, then I went to uh, PS86. So that was a great school. Right. You know, uh, when I graduated from PS86, I went to junior high school 143. Where's that at? On, uh, right off of Sedwick, off of Kingsbridge Terrace in the Bronx. Got it. By Lehman College. All right. Right, right, right by the reservoir. Yeah. And that's where it all started, actually. That's where I was introduced to breaking. I saw a crowd outside one day at lunchtime, and I went running over in, in the playground. Oh, well, what year was that? Or what grade? Uh, I was in seventh grade. Seventh grade. Seventh grade. So I, I ran over, and I see these two kids. One kid's name was Savage. I always forget the other kid's name. But they're doing all these acrobatic stuff and gymnastic stuff on the floor. And at first I thought, you know what? What are these guys doing? Like, it looks like they're just cleaning the floor with their clothes. Right. I actually made fun of them and walked away. That's the ironic part about it. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm like, oh, those kids, whatever they're doing, they're wasting their time. <laughs> so, again, like, when my mother, my brothers, you know, friends, when I tell them this, they're like, wow, that's crazy. Because then to embrace it and, and take it to where the level where we took it to, that when I first saw it, it didn't impact me like everybody else. I, I met a lot of other uh, b-boys that they first saw it and they were like, wow, that's incredible. To me, I was like, eh, and walked away. <laughs> got it, got it. All right, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And I haven't heard about uh, one of you b-boys in that Lehman College area yet. So, okay, you know, awesome, awesome. Now. In that neighborhood, were there any gangs? Could you talk about any visible signs of gangs or experience? There were, there were gangs. I mean, not really like gangs anymore because I was more in the South Bronx. There was more like the Savage Nomads, the Black Spades, Got it. the Bachelors, the Savage Skulls. That was, we were surrounded by all of that. We were very fortunate that DSR, who's one of the leaders of the Savage Nomads, was, lived in our building. And Is that what he wrote, DSR? DSR, yeah, and he's still known by that to this day, you know? Um, I've been reaching out for him. I've been trying to contact him for the last couple of years. Um, finally got a con in contact with him through somebody else. But I, I'm, I'm dying to meet up with him because he was the guy that we all looked up to. And again, going back to us being safe in the neighborhood, it was partly because of that. You know, the Savage Nomads were on my block. So nobody could touch us. Nobody could mess with us. If a stranger walked on my block, he stood out like a sore thumb. My mother never worried about us. That's the crazy thing. We're outside playing in the street, and the only time she came outside was seven o'clock, seven thirty. Kids, everybody upstairs. You got school tomorrow, you know. Right. But we were protected, you know, by the gangs. 
Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's that's good to hear and good mm -hmm. to know. You know yeah. what, what you guys experienced and what you had to live through. Yeah, it was a positive thing. It wasn't a negative thing. Right. Everyone saw the negativity, but they didn't see the positivity. Right. You know, these guys were, again, they were very protective of us because we were the kids on the block. You know, they were only they were only 14, 15 year old kids themselves. Right. You know, when I was seven, eight years old, nine years old. But uh, they were like our big brothers. And people respected them and people were afraid of them because of who they were. You know? Right. And I love that. I, I used to love that. You know? And my mother loved them. My mother would feed them too from time to time. Right, right. You know, if they, if one of them was hungry and didn't have any money or something like that. You know? It was it, it was a great time in my life. Wow, wow. Were they great visible time. in school? No, not really. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> not really. <laughs> all right, all right. And how about what, what high school did you go to? I went to Kennedy High School. That's when really things got serious. Again, Crazy Legs, Mr. Freeze, uh, a couple of other dancers. Okay. Uh, Angel, who was uh, part of Rocker's Revenge, his name was Tiny, who played, uh, he actually doubled for uh, Robert Lee Taylor in the movie Beat Street. Okay. Because Lee was a good dancer, but he wasn't extraordinary. So they d dressed up Tiny, who looked just like him, and he he did uh, he doubled for him in a couple of the scenes where he did the 1990 and stuff like that. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Cool. A little bit of Beach Street history. Yeah, of course, man. Awesome. Hey, so, were you a rock dancer or rocker at all before breaking? Not it at was just all. Breaking. Just Straight breaking. Into breaking. Just breaking. The Seven Deadly Sins, who were from Morris. Uh, DJ Cool Sky, who was the leader. He had two brothers, Reggie and Wilski. Little Lep was a big part of the organization. You had other other guys, uh, Puppet Man. You had Eric. Was that the you first had, crew you were down with, the Seven Deadly Sins? No, we weren't down with them. I wanted to be down with them. Got it. That was the crew that solidified everything in the Bronx for me. You know, they, these guys were untouchable. And they were all perfectionists. These guys were incredible. You know, and again, the Seven Deadly Sins, if it wasn't for them, you know, that's why I try never to, to not mention them in any interview and stuff like that, because they were a big part of us. Right. You know, we looked up to them. And anywhere they went to battle and stuff like that, I went to watch. I was constantly there. Okay. You know? Um, but they're a big part of our history. All right. Yeah. So, so that, and that's awesome to have a crew to look up to. Yeah. Did you have any individual mentors in breaking? I had one, uh, again, his name was Eric, who was actually the weakest dancer in the Seven Deadly Sins. Oh, wow. Like, he was the kid <laughs> that they held back. No, no, you're not going now. You're not going. <laughs> but you know what? He took a liking to me, and he was the one that taught me the fundamentals, believe it or not. He taught me the six step. He taught me my first chairs and stuff like that, you know? And it, it was crazy because him teaching me and us practicing together in our hallway, we used to practice in the hallway in the building. Right, right. It didn't matter if it was raining, if it was cold. We all got together, a group of kids, and we would practice. Either in your hallway, in my hallway, wherever we can practice where nobody would bother us for a certain amount of time. Because then somebody would always come out, you, you guys are making noise, get out of here. You know, stuff like that. Right, so right. we would have to move it to another building. But um, as I kept practicing and I started getting really good, he noticed it. He's like, wow, man, dude, you're better than me now. And it was only a couple of months. But I really fell in love with the dance, you right. know. And again, having a gymnastic background, a martial arts background, I took to it with no problem. Like it was, it became a part of me. That's awesome. You said his yeah. name was Eric. Eric. Did he have a b-boy name? No, that was his name, Eric. A black kid too. I appreciate was, the yeah. respect. Mm -hmm. Definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. Was he down with a crew? He was down with seven. Other than the Seven Deadly Sins. No, no, no. Got it. Again, he was one of the younger guys from the Seven Deadly Sins who wasn't that good. So you could say like part of the B team. Sweet. But he took me under his arm, and and let any one of them that would willing to teach me things, I didn't care who it was. But I was so glad that he did that for me because you know, it, again, it changed my life. Appreciate the respect you passing down, brother. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, what does the B in B boy, as you learned it, mean to you? Bronx boy. For? I I to me in my heart, Bronx boy, all the way. That's what it is. People will dispute that. Everybody has their own opinion. I respect that, you know, but that's what it is. Got you. Bronx boy. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, the meaning, what does being a b-boy mean to you? What is it? Describe a b-boy. If you had to describe a b-boy in your own words. Well, I would have to describe myself. <laughs> um, 
a kid um, that's been through struggles, didn't have an easy life, who was talented in his own right, who needed some, who needed something to do. You know what I'm saying? Um, being a b-boy, that was that was part of my essence. You know what I'm saying? Like it 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 became a part of me. You know, I walked into a room. And that's what you saw, a b-boy. You know, people saw it. We, we, they saw it without us talking. Just walking in, my, the way I stood, my sneakers, how I was dressed, my attitude, everything was there. And to me, I, I, listen, again, like people have their own perspective and their own opinions. But when you went to clubs, another b-boy could walk in and I already knew he was a b-boy. Just by the way he looked right. and the way he stood. Got it. One thing that I haven't been asking in other interviews, but you know, everyone had a bop, you know? The diddy bop. <laughs> there you go, everyone had a b-boy bop, you yep. know what I'm saying, a b-bop yeah. that, that they, yeah. how they walk. That's your bravado, you know, showing everybody, Talk no, me don't, me, don't mess with me. This is who I am, I'm cool, I'm super fly. You know, because again, we all looked up to all those movies too. Right. All those cultural uh, black and Hispanic movies that came out back in the days, you know? Right, right. So again, Superfly was one of the movies that we kind of like emulated. We wanted to be like, those you know? black exploitation films? Yeah, a lot of that went on, you know, in the 70s, you know? Yeah. But we brought, took a piece of that and put it into that culture, you know? Like that be also became a part of the b-boy stance. That's what I call it, you know? All right. Kind of around the same, you know, vibe. What does being a b-boy mean to you? It, it's I, 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 it's a little hard to describe. I don't know. Again, I would just have to go according to myself. It's just being a, a, a badass kid, man. Being a tough kid. You know, being a, the best dancer you can be. Okay. You know, someone that you don't mess with. You know, and then having a crew, having a family behind you just made you stronger, more powerful. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. The, uh, now, you were originally with the Floor Masters. Was that the first crew? Yes. Talk to me about how you became a member of the Floor Masters, how the Floor Masters got their name, just how, how they evolved and became the Floor Masters. My best friend, Noel, who also used to break dance, again, um... You know, the funny thing is, I don't even know how he learned his uh, fun uh, fundamentals. I got to sit down and ask him that. But he came to me one day, knocked on my door. I opened the door. He was just came from a jam. Now, obviously, I wasn't with him. We were always together. Around what year? Uh, I want to say 78. Okay. Yeah. So he came, he knocks on my door. And he goes, let's start a b-boy crew. And I'm like, cool, let's do it. Like that. So we started practicing. We started gathering up a few of the kids around the neighborhood. Sooner or later, we had about five ki kids, seven kids, ten kids. We had no name. We were just practicing, practicing, practicing. My mother went to a wedding in Brooklyn, which, again, that's where I was born and raised in the beginning. So I went to the wedding. I saw this kid up rocking, doing Brooklyn rock. Right, right. So I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, I'm rocking. And I'm like, okay. He goes, you know how to rock? And I said, no, I don't know how to rock, but I know how to break. So then I went down and I started breaking. And he was like, what's that? Like, why are you on the floor? So now we're questioning each other's style. Right, right. So the whole family is watching us. He's up rocking, I'm breaking, and they're trying to, they're trying to figure out what's going on here, you know? <laughs> and his name was Edwin. He was a good friend of my cousin. And he was part of a crew called the Floor Master Dancers in Brooklyn. They were rockers. They were up rockers. Got it. They were outlaws. So I was like, wow, man, that's pretty cool. Like, I didn't know how to do that. He was willing to teach me, but I was so involved with the breakdancing already that I was like, nah, we're good. I said, although I have an idea, you think I can use the name and make up the vision in the Bronx of Breakers? And since he was part of, uh, I think he was uh, like the vice president of the Floor Master Dancers, he said, sure, no problem, cool. But instead of calling ourselves the Floor Master Dancers, I said, we're just going to call ourselves the Floor Master Crew because we were Breakers. We weren't up rockers. Right, right. You know, and that's how the name came about. And then again, we just started gathering kids. I mean, I mean, we had 20 kids at one time. Who were the original members of the Floor Masters? Oh my God, we had Bebop, we had Snap, we had Kid Romance, we had Benny, we had Fast Break, we had Flex, uh, 
it's it, it just so many. Uh, forget it. I mean, we, and again, little by little, as we started getting better, some kids didn't. So those were the kids that kind of got left behind. They weren't evolving. They weren't improving. You know, and most of us were. You know, so the, I kind of kept the best together. Right. You know, and uh, I felt bad every once in a while. You know, leaving the, the other guys behind. But again, you couldn't have a crew. You know, ten, twenty guys. I mean, I mean, not to me anyway. I figured a good ten kids, maybe eight kids, would have been perfect as a legitimate b-boy crew. So what? What, what year did you establish the Floor Masters crew? Like 81, 80, 81. Got yeah. it, got yeah. it. When, when, when did they kind of dissolve? Uh, we went against, we were invited to dance against Rocksteady at the Negril. This was another famous battle. Right. And uh, Africa Islam was there. Michael Holman, who became our manager later on, he was the one who was involved with. And he owned the grill. No, he didn't own it, but okay. I know he was able to have one night. Oh, and he right. took that night and did a hip hop night. All right. Now this is in the city. They never saw anything like this. So he brought the best DJs, the best breakers, you know. So we danced against Rocksteady at one event, one of his events, and uh, obviously we beat them. We were a lot better than them, and he was really, really imp impressed. He was really impressed with us, you know, with our talent, how different we were, how much faster, how you know, how we were just our moves were evolved, you know. Rock City was always good, right? But they're kind of old school. They kind of always stood that way. They never wanted to really get into the power moves and stuff like that, you know. So then, uh, Michael Homan was a big part of the transition from the Floor Masters to the New York City Breakers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now the Floor Masters broke up, or a few crews, or a couple of crews came out of the Floor Masters, right? Right. You have the Incredible Breakers, right. who was Chino and Brian and Sammy. They went their own way. Um, we had quite a, a flex and uh, a couple other guys went to Florida. They went to Florida. They established another crew out there. They got involved with music and stuff like that. But yeah, everybody kind of went their own way and I kept the original like five or six guys together, the most powerful guys. And how did the New York City Breakers come about, get their name? I always loved the name, the Floor Masters. I never wanted to change it. You know, we had a, a, a business meeting one time, and it was, you know, me and all the guys. Michael Holman was there. We even had a good friend, Phase Two, who passed away, the graffiti writer. And he was also there. He was a big part of the New York City Breakers also. And uh, Michael came up with an idea. He goes, what do you think about changing the name? And I wasn't too crazy about that at first. And he goes, um, you know, traveling around the world, think about it. Now we're on a world stage. We're in Europe. We could be in the Middle East. We could be in Asia. You know, they're going to introduce you as the Floor Masters or the New York City Breakers. And it made sense in a business aspect, right. you know. So it took a while for me to get used to it. And then I agreed to it and we finally did it. And again, I never wanted to change the name because I love the Floor Master name. But I think it was a good business decision. Okay. You know, it it it, it, it again like he was uh, he was a big part of that. You know, like he saw something that I didn't see at first, but then I understood as far as business. God. You know, introducing us again on the other side of the world as the New York City Breakers means a lot. Right. It tells you where we're from. All right, but the New York City Breakers is a Bronx crew. Right. Right. Got gotcha. you. As a b-boy, as a breaker, what were you specifically known for? I mean, you've got you got breaking, right. you got popping, you know, locking. Was there anything? And then you got the power moves for breaking. Anything specific that says this is action, Chino? This is what he's known for. Everyone, everyone. I think my speed. I think back then, like there was nobody faster than me. Um, I was a little more technical. Again, being a gymnast, when I did my windmills, my legs were really wide open. I tried to flare my, my toes out, you know. I've always looked up to Kirk Thomas, the gymnast who created the Thomas Flare. Right. You know. So, um, it, was, it was that. And, and it was other people that told me that. It wasn't me. It was other people telling me, like, you're just different. Like, Pex was really great. I, I never considered myself to be the best one in the crew. Right. You know, okay. I never said that. I mean, if, 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 if I had to choose who was the best, I would say it was Corey, Icy Ice, and then Pex, and then maybe me. 
you know, but a lot of people said I was the best. And again, that's just their opinion. But I understand why they said that because, of, again, the way I did certain things. Not only that, in, in, the, in the early 80s, when I really found myself, like there's a scene in the movie Body Rock with Lorenzo Lamas where we're dancing in Washington Square Park. Okay. And he's walking by and he sees me. I do a combination in that movie. When I tell you that it's perfect, and I'm saying this myself about myself, it's just perfect. Like it's beautiful. You see the art. You don't. You don't. You don't just see a kid doing windmills. You. You. There's something there. There's something happening. You know. And I finally got to see it. And again, that's when I grew into myself. I knew where my hands belonged. I know how much power I needed. Everything was perfect. Wow, that's awesome. Now, what years? If if you were to say, Action Chino, I was a breaker from '78 to '84. You know, what years would you encompass that you say you were active as a breaker? Well, I started in 78. When I Again, when I found myself, when I was at my best, I want to say 84, 85, 86. Okay. Yeah, that's when, again, we were like untouchable. You know, there were other crews coming out of the woodwork. Everyone was battling us. I had a kid today write me uh, today on my Instagram. Do you remember battling us? And he told me the name of the crew. And I said, listen, honestly... I don't, I apologize, yeah. but we battled so many crews back then because everybody wanted to take that title, you know? Right, right. And it, was, it, was, it just wasn't possible. Each of us individually mastered a certain move. So if you had a crew, and if you came out and you did windmills, that was me, I got you. If you came out and you did a hand glide, that was Matthew, glide master. If you came out and you did footwork style, chairs, that was Little Lep. We had everything covered. And that's something that Michael saw. That was the power crew. That was something that he saw. And 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 again, there was nothing that anybody can do back then mm -hmm. that could touch us. Wow. Yeah. Now, before 78, right? We're talking, there were B-boys in 78. Yes, there were. before 78. Mm -hmm. Were any of them known to you? No, again, I saw the two kids dancing. I didn't know who they were. You know, um, I ended up finding out about one kid. His name was Savage. And he was pretty good. He was well known as a b boy, okay. but again, it wasn't important to me. Like I was like, I, I didn't even find, ha have any interest, you know. But uh, but it was all around me. B boying was all around me, all the time. Again, I just didn't understand it. Right. You know. Cool, cool, cool. Now, if you had to say, everyone's got a b boy anthem that that they they just can't. Sit on the sideline. You got to get in that circle. Right. What was your b-boy anthem? This is oh man. I got a routine for that Apache When Apache came on and again, my mother went and bought this record, you know Bongo rock Apache. These were all the records that my mother was buying Playing in the house You know the Mexican and me being a kid Again not knowing anything about breaking or anything like that um, Again, I'm just very young my mother was just very in tune with music and maybe from her friends too because again it was her and all her girlfriends okay. back then who were like my aunts you know right right you know your tia you know right so again they were playing all this incredible music that as i got older i'm like wait a minute this is what my mother was listening to you know the somakusa the apache you know the bongo rock it, it, it was you know I, I don't know if it was a cultural thing or a neighborhood thing you know but um, yeah, Apache. I gotta say Apache. To this day, if I hear it, I'm like, <laughs> I get amped up. I can't dance anymore. <laughs> got you, got you. Your brand new B boy, 1978. What crews existed when you became a B boy in '78? Uh, you had Star Child of Rock. You had TBB. You had. Uh, uh, Seven Deadly Sins, who are, again, predominantly, you know, in our neighborhood, who we looked up to, you know. Um, I know there were others, but being new to it and being young, you know, and still not understanding. Right, right, right. You know, learning about the, the dance culture itself, because, again, we were young. Like, even when Lep became part of our crew, again, I grew up with Lep. I grew up looking up to him, right. you know. So him ending up 
um, joining the, the the New York City Breakers and being becoming a becoming a part of us, like we got to travel the world together. We got to sit and I finally got to sit and talk to him and tell him all these things about how he you know how I looked up to him and he was amazed because you know I had evolved and I was really really good at the time. So he was like, "That's crazy!" Like it made him feel good too. And and and, and again, I was just paying homage, you know. And it, it, again, it was my pleasure. To share the stage with this man. This guy was incredible. Lepi used to battle Cruz by himself. That's how incredible he was. I mean, like I think he was undefeated, like six, seven crews. Like five, six, seven guys would try to take him out and he would serve all of them. Wow. That's how unbelievable he was. And he was very well known. Right. And a lot of people don't know Little Lep stands for Little Leprechaun. Really? Yeah. Got it. People call him Little Lep and they don't understand. Nobody, it's only been a handful of people within the years. What's Lep? <laughs> Little Leprechaun was his name because he was so tiny. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Mm -hmm. But he packed a hell of a lot of power. Oof. Huh? Oof. Guy was unbelievable. Cool. Can you, can you talk to us? Well, before the venues, we were speaking about you. You were telling me you used to, you guys would travel and go battle other crews. Mm -hmm. What's, if you can, what's your most memorable battle and against what crew and why? I, I wouldn't say I have one. I would say a few and I'll tell you why. All right. Because us being the floor masters, we did something that a lot of other kids didn't do. We went into their neighborhoods. We went looking for scrambling feet. We went looking for the dynamic rockers. We went looking for um, Rocksteady. Rocksteady used to hang out at a club called, uh, oh my God, First Class on the Grand Concourse. Okay. Very well known. So we knew that they were there every Friday and Saturday night. We just went there. They found out ahead of time, again, because we had kind of planned it. So again, you know, in the streets, they got around, and again, they found out, and they were kind of like ready for us. Right. But we went right to their club. We went right in there. And let me tell you something. That's one hell of a battle that I wish somebody would have got on film. What year? What grade were you in? Uh, I want to say that was like 81, 82. Oh, that right. was during the time when they were really big and going back and forth with Dynamic. Got yeah, it. like 81, 82. Yeah. But again, that's when we were already like improving and improving and improving. You know, We were practicing every day. Now, the day went by that we weren't either outside practicing or part of a school program that they had in Walton High School. They had an after-school program every Monday, I think Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday from 6.30 to 9.30. Now, it was for basketball. It was for playing chess. You know, there was a lot. You could swim. They had a pool. All right. We took one whole gym, and we threw all the basketball players out, and we filled it up with b-boys. And breakers from all around came because they found out that was our rehearsal spot. And we let everyone in. Right, right. I didn't care what crew you in. But again, but everybody had their own little circle. You know, everybody's kind of watching everybody, you know. But um, we practiced every day. We practiced our asses off. You know, they, there wasn't a day that went by going home with bruises, you know, with cuts, you know, mm -hmm. with burns from the floor, you know. Right. Constantly putting in the work, putting in the work. Again, that's another reason why... We got to where we were. You know, we really put everything that we had into the dance. Wow, that's that, that's incredible. Um, can you tell me about any spots, locations, you know, venues that you performed in that were memorable? Lincoln Center, Kennedy Center, you know, oh Graffiti Rock. Yeah, I mean, the list goes on. I mean, our biggest venue was the 50th president, presidential inauguration, which was for uh, Reagan and Bush. I mean, there was 180 people there. Wow. You know, then you have the Kennedy Center Honors, where we did a, a dance tribute to Catherine Dunham. And again, I met all my heroes. I met Burt Lancaster, Jimmy Stewart, Tony Randall from The Odd Couples. These are all guys that I looked up to. And I got to meet and shake their hands. Lou Ross, Elizabeth Taylor. Like, we're all in the green room eating cookies and talking and, and taking pictures. And I was a part of that, that, that celebrity status. We were in there with them. You know, sitting down with, with uh, Linda Carter, Wonder Woman. I danced with Wonder Woman. She's six feet tall. I'm like five nothing. And I'm dancing with her, you know. I mean, I, again, the, the venues were incredible. Who's Latina, by the way? That's right. A lot of people don't know that. I'm That's glad right. you brought that up. And proud, too. Yeah, and proud very proud. Latina. That's right. But, um, man, uh, again, like, we went to uh, England and we danced for the Queen. That was in... Uh, 
I forgot the name of the venue, but it was a big royalty place where they have all their performances and stuff. I mean, again, and nobody's done that. Nobody's done that. You know what I'm saying? It, it is what it is, you know? Presidential inaugurations. Hey. Performing for the Queen of Great Britain. Having your own TV show. Soul Train. Talk to us about your TV show. Oh, see, Michael, that was all Michael's idea. He came up with a, with a show. Uh, he wanted it to kind of to emulate, like, uh, Soul Train. Okay. You know, but just in a more hip hop, graffiti, DJing, performing, breaking, and uh, he put it together, man. And the show was amazing. What was the show called? Graffiti Rock. All right. Yeah, so we, we we had uh, Shannon, we had Run DMC, we had Kumo D, we had Special K, we had all kinds of performers on there, and we also had a lot of freestyle break dancers back then in the crowd that were from other crews. All you right. Know? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, no, the show was uh, fantastic. We did a pilot, and as you know, when you show a pilot, it has to get uh, distributed, so, you know, people have to look at it, you know. Is that um, when Shannon play Let the Music Play? Yes, yes. Got it. Uh, no, and Give Me the Night. Give Me Tonight. Give Me Tonight, right? Give Me Tonight. Give Me Tonight, yes. Which was actually, that's when Freestyle came in and started pushing hip-hop out. Right. A lot of people don't know that. Right. I'm at the Roxy, and it's all hip-hop. All of a sudden, you hear this record come on, and we were like, wow, this sounds cool, bro. Right. And we're dancing to it, and we're, we're rocking to it, and it was Shannon. So that, believe it or not, is one of the original freestyle records that came out. And I was just telling that to uh, a couple of friends of mine and my girlfriend, and the other day, I just saw a guy do on TikTok where he said the same exact thing. Right. He said, you know, when Shannon came, that's when hip hop started to like 86, 87, and freestyle really started to dominate. I remember the first time I went to Roxy's with Scrambled Feet, mm -hmm. Shaka Khan was on stage. I was there. <laughs> I was there. <laughs> it was like, I was like, oh my gosh. This she is was awesome. I never got to perform with her, but I got to meet her. She was an extraordinary person, beautiful. Again, I know other breakers that were that got to, the chance to perform with her. Right. I wish it was us, but it didn't happen. But she was an amazing talent also, yeah. All right. Best performance or choreography at Graffiti Rock? Your memory. Walking onto stage. Talk to me about your participation in Graffiti Rock. Well, you got to remember, it's our show. So that right there in itself. We're there walking. We're walking around like... You know, this is it. Now we have our own show. This was us. Now, yeah, we had celebrities on there performing, but they were guests. Right. If the show would have taken off, the New York City Breakers was going to have a segment in each show every time it was shown. How long did the Graffiti Rock last? It only lasted one, uh, one season because, again, it never got picked up. I don't know why. I know they went back and forth. The idea was great. I mean, you can see the whole show right now on YouTube. It's fantastic. People still love it. People still talk about it. The graffiti was all real. The music was all real. The dancing was all real. The host was all real. Everything was real. Not like movies that were done where the graffiti was fake, done by union artists, right. or the, the the DJs were also fake. You know, the dancers weren't that good. You know, stuff like that. You know, graffiti rock was one hundred percent hip hop. Wow, wow. Talk to me about. All right, you already talked to me about going to first class with Rocksteady in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. How about your most memorable battle in Queens? Who'd you, who'd you go back? Oh man, we would. Uh, Victor had got in touch with us, and uh, they had sent a video to a show called "That's Incredible." So "That's Incredible" was coming down to film them. So he came up with the idea of not just filming them. Why don't we get another crew to battle so that they can film it for the TV show? Right. So he got in touch with me. He was like, "Are you willing to battle my crew on TV?" And I said, "Let's do it, man. We don't shy away from anybody." Again, we traveled. There was like 20, 30 of us because we also had an entourage. But we all traveled to Queens, to USA Roller Skating Ring, and we danced on their turf, you know? And listen, like I tell Victor to this day and everybody else, they were better than us that night. We gave them a hell of a run, but Dynamic was no joke. Right. And again, those guys too, I, I looked up to them too because they were the innovators. Those were the guys with the power moves. 
with I mean they were doing things that I'm like the continuous head spin you know Kid Freeze who invented that right. like they came out with a lot of awesome stuff you know and it, it was just my pleasure to dance against them and we're very good friends I'm very good friends with all of them more like family you know but then we danced against them a couple of other times and it wasn't that close anymore there you go <laughs> <laughs> all right all right how about uh Brooklyn who'd you battle in Brooklyn that that was memorable well I remember a group came from Brooklyn and they met us in the Rockley in All the Roxy. Right. Brooklyn wasn't that nice. All and right. what I mean by that is that they had a lot of violent crews. So they didn't take losing very well. <laughs> yeah. So um, there was a crew, I don't even remember their name, but they came down and uh, we had a really awesome battle in the Roxy and things got ugly. Got really ugly. We kind of like had to run out of there for our lives <laughs> that, that, that tells us what breaking was like in yeah Brooklyn. yeah and Bro again Brooklyn was no joke when it when it came again they didn't like losing to anything <laughs> all right cool cool you know no no disrespect to Staten Island but we ain't gonna go there uh did you I didn't even know that I didn't even know they existed <laughs> how about Manhattan Manhattan's big well, well Manhattan was a mixture see a lot of people don't understand Rocksteady actually was for Manhattan like you know like yeah, they had a couple of their co-founders that were from the Bronx, but like Legs wasn't from the Bronx. None of those guys were from the Bronx. You know, all those guys are really from Manhattan. Like I remember going to Dykeman when they filmed 2020, the TV show. Uh, they did a, like a semi-documentary on okay. Breaking, and again, we weren't a part of it, but I was there. You know, I was there, and it was filmed in uh, in Manhattan, right over the bridge in uh, Washington uh, Washington uh, Heights. Got it. Got yeah, it. yeah. You know, Ma Manhattan literally had most of the big clubs yeah a lot of know. the badass clubs yeah, yeah and any clubs i mean you've mentioned the roxy which eventually turned to 17. Well, back then it was more roller skating rings so manhattan had spin easy that's right and that's where we used to dance at you know they had all the competitions Where's there spin easy at? it's right over the bridge on fordham road where jimmy's bronx cafe used to be the original right okay right over the bridge when you go into washington heights right into manhattan you have columbia university yep all right there. So Spin Easy was right there, right next to, there was a path mark there that my godmother was actually the, the supervisor there. Yeah, and right next to it was Spin Easy Roller Skating Ring, and that place was jumping, you know? But that's that's basically, for us, the, the Manhattan vibe in the beginning where a lot of the breakdancing took, took place in Spin Easy. Right, right. Yeah. And uh, was there a certain routine or performance that you created that's just memorable? I know you well, told me I, about that that very technical windmills that you mm -hmm. had. Well, when it came to the choreography, uh, me and Noel, who was also a, a badass choreographer, um, we kind of like did everything. We we always chore choreographed all the shows, uh, the routines and everything. So it wasn't just me by myself, but we always put our heads together and we came up with certain things because we knew what who can do what, you know. We knew what how to connect all the fellas. How to connect the dots, you know what I'm saying? So when it came to the choreography, me and Noel actually put it together. But he was, I want to say the major part of the choreography was Kid Nice, Noel. Got it, got mm -hmm. it. And I was going to ask you, what, what was his b-boy name? Kid Nice. Kid Nice, yeah. Gotcha. Still is to this day. And he's a man. <laughs> they should call him Man Nice. <laughs> I hear you. A lot of people had the kid in front of their name. Yeah, you know, like we're grown men and they're still Kid Freeze, Kid Nice. Right, right. Yeah. And Glide went to Mr. Glide. Well, he, he started out as Mr. Glide, then Glide. Right. Well, and then his son is Kid Glide. Kid Glide, right. And Corey, Icy Ice, was Little Glide when he was in Dynamic. I remember. Yes. I, I remember that in another interview. Yes, yes, yes. Mentioned. That's awesome. Now, did the New York City Breakers have a dedicated DJ, you know, um, that maybe mixed specific break beats for your choreography? We had we had one cat that Michael Holman brought in who was called DJ High Priest. He was a white cat, white guy, and he lived in uh, the Lower East Side. Okay. And he hung out with a lot of you know black and Hispanic DJs, and got really good. And you know he was affordable at the time, so Mike introduced me to him. I went to his house. We actually kind of auditioned him, you know, and he's the one DJing when we did uh, one of the TV shows called PM Magazine. He, and and we're, in the, we're in the park dancing with all the graffiti brims doing the graffiti live. DJ High Priest is DJing and the New York City Breakers are breaking. So he was the one predominantly in the beginning, kind of stood with us for a while, but then kind of went his own way with his, with his music and stuff like that. But he's really the only DJ that we worked with, like, together. Okay. Now, as far as DJing, I mean, we worked with Bam, we worked with Jazzy Jeff, with Jazzy J. We worked with 
uh, Charlie Chase. We worked with all of them. But again, they were all part of different organization and different entities, you know? Right. You, yeah. Earlier, you, you, you mentioned a very significant writer, Phase Two. Yeah. He was also known for being a first generation yes. B boy. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. did, did you ever witness Phase Two breaking? I actually the hand? did. I All right, talk yeah, to us. I actually did. He wasn't good. <laughs> <laughs> but he was like one day we were joking around and we were in uh, Michael's loft and he was like man I could still I, I, I got it and I'm like let me see what you could do so I just egged him on and he went down he did a couple of things but let me tell you something when you see someone who started this way before you did and even if he did a little something it meant something to you you know I remember meeting Spy I remember meeting Batch these guys you know, Track 2, Rubber Band, Mongo Rock. These are all the guys that I looked up to. Again, Little Lep. When they danced, again, I caught them at the time where they were on their way out. You know, so again, they weren't that good, but they were still, you know, a little something. A little fire still there, you know. But just to see them do that was special. Right, it was right. really, really special. And it was a different yeah. breaking. Yeah, it was. It was a whole yeah. different yeah. dance, a whole different style. It, it was limited. You know, there was only certain things that they did and certain things that they could do because all the advanced stuff wasn't done yet, you know. But let me tell you, it was still amazing. It was still amazing. Those guys, I take nothing from them. I was with Track 2 at an event uh, two, two months ago, and we were stuck together all night. Like, I was asking them questions and questions and... I, anything that I can get out of him, you know, yeah. and the things that he told me in those couple of hours that we were together was amazing. Amazing, because I've been doing this for years, and I'm considered an original Grandmaster B-Boy, you know, that's what, you know, but I'm nothing compared to some of these guys. Right, right. So when I get the, even me now, as a grown man, I feel like a little kid when I'm around these guys. That when I get the opportunity to sit and talk with these guys, I take it. You're starstruck. Oh my God, of course, you know? And I think that's the problem today with a lot of the new generation kids, you know? They don't know, they don't know their history. You know, how you know your future if you don't know your history, you know? Um, I went on a cruise with my family, and we looked at the itinerary, and they had a performance on the boat. A breakdancing performance. So my wife says, oh, wow, look. It was a 30-minute performance. So I'm like, I got to see this. We performed. It was seven, eight, ten minutes tops. And we were exhausted. So I'm looking at this pamphlet, and it says a 30-minute show, breakdancing show. We go into the audience. We sit down. We're on a cruise ship. Venue is beautiful. The stage is huge. These three kids come out. They dance for 30 minutes. Do, do you know where these kids came from? What happened was, after the show, my son, I got up, and we're walking out. My son says, Dad, let's let's meet the guys. I, I, you wanna? And I said, no, nah, you know, I, I'm not I'm not that guy. You know, and my son went to that, this is my father, you know, Chino from the New York City Breakers. You know, I already knew it. I already knew what was his plan, you know. So I, I'm like, son, you know, we don't have to do that. You know, these kids were awesome, you know. So eventually, we stood there. The kids came out. And he tells the kid, you guys were amazing and all that. I told him how amazing they were. The show was great. It was great. And when I say kids, these guys were in their late 20s, early 30s. Oh. Yeah. You know, so, but to me, they're kids, you know. But anyway, so my son says, you know, this is my dad. Action. So, like, it's a pleasure to meet you. Do you know him? And the main guy goes, no, I don't know him. And I'm like, okay. So, my, he's the leader from the New York City Breakers, the movie Beach Street. And he was like... Like, he didn't even know. Right, right. You know? And my son was, like, a little baffled because of my history and stuff like that. So, it was a pleasure meeting them. The, again, they were great. Take nothing from them. We walked away, and I, I took my son, and I said, you have to understand something. Just because people are breakdancers and are breaking today doesn't mean that they know your father. Right. You know? There are a lot of kids doing this now. They don't care about their history. They don't care about where it's from. And to me, it's a shame. And he saw that. My son was like 11 years old, and he saw that. He was like, but dad, how can they do this and not know about you? It makes no sense. And I said, exactly. See, when I started, I wanted to meet the founders. I wanted to meet the guys that started this, you know, because learning more about the past, it just, I knew it was just going to make me a better dancer, a better b-boy. And you got to pay homage to those guys. If those guys didn't do it, we wouldn't be here. If we didn't do it, these kids today wouldn't be here. I had a kid uh, a couple of months ago 
disrespect me on social media. And I was so hurt, you know? I was so hurt. And I said, listen, everybody has the right to their opinion. He didn't like my opinion on certain things. And I get it, you know? But he went to a different place, you know? You know, you, you could have spoke to me in a different way, you know? Right. And again, I, I, reached up, I reached back to him and I said, listen, I wish you all the best, you know, because I don't have time to argue with anybody. I know what, who I am and I know what I've done. And, you know, the funny thing is that this kid, who I don't know, another part of the world, is questioning me. And if you don't know who I am, you, you go do your research first, brother. Then come back. Then come back to me. And then we'll sit and talk. And I will give you the time, you know. So I, I think it's a shame, these kids, that today they don't really, you know, learn their history, you know. Though some of them do. I got a lot, I got hundreds of thousands of kids writing to me every day, right, right. especially with the Olympics that came out, you know. They know how involved I was with that in 84, doing the show PM Magazine, where we challenged the Olympic team, how I saw breakdancing evolving and being a gymnast and being part of the team in Kennedy High School. I never wanted this to be a fad. People always said breakdancing was a fad. It's going to be a fad. It's going to go away. It's going... And I said, no, this is not going to go away. So I kind of always leaned it toward it being a sport, you know. There are a lot of older b-boys that don't agree with it because they consider a cultural art form. And I get that. I, I understand that. But we need to keep this alive. Right. So if that's the next stage, then that's the next stage. That's it. Let it. Everything evolves. Right. Everything evolves, yeah. you know. From burning and rocking to breaking, yeah. you know, to this these crazy acrobatic performances that I'm watching today that it's like, wow. Just the crazy thing is that me and Kid Nice would sit at rehearsal and we would practice for hours and we would exchange ideas and we would sing things like that. Imagine doing an aerial and doing a flare in the air. We were talking about that in the 80s. Were we able to do it? Hell no. Right, right, right. But we were already talking about that about how could that happen, how could it be done, taking action figures and moving them around and figuring things out, you know, and this is what we did, because, again, me and Noel, we kind of like went a whole different direction, we saw the future, you know what I'm saying, and eventually we knew we were going to get older, but we also wanted this to carry on, and we wanted the kids to, you know, to carry the torch, you know, so again, we always saw it as it being a sport and being in the Olympics. And I said this in 83, 84. Talk to us about the day you said it, where you were at. And how did that question even come up? Well, again, being a gymnast myself, um, I always put some of my gymnast techniques into my breakdancing. So we did a show called PM Magazine where they came to my house. They filmed us dancing in my neighborhood. The whole neighborhood came out to support us. It's a beautiful scene. It was a beautiful day. Um, my mom was there. My whole entire family's there. All my friends and family. It, it was like a gathering. Again, just a family gathering right in front of my building. It was beautiful. But then after the show, after we danced, we went into my mother's house. And they sat down with us individually and they interviewed us. And during the interview is when I said it. I said, you know, uh, this is not a fad, you know. And that's when I challenged the gold medalist floor exercise team to a competition. And we were ready to go to L.A. Because that's when they were going to have the opening ceremonies. Right. And Lionel Richie came out with a whole bunch of kids from California. And they did the breakdancing scene. During the closing ceremony. Oh, the closing ceremony. I thought it was the opening ceremony. It wasn't the opening ceremony? Well, we'll, we'll double check that. Yeah. yeah. We'll double check Either that. or. Either yeah, or. Exactly. I was disappointed because we were supposed to do that. But because we were professionals already getting paid and we were making a lot of money, yeah. they had breakdancers there in L.A., who they didn't pay, you know. You know, my, my own personal opinion on that, and I mean, it's when I saw that performance at the LA Olympics, I was like, that's not breaking. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And this is the problem that we have today. This is the problem that we have today. People see poppers and booging, and they say, oh, look at a breaker. He's not a breaker. You know, I, I and, and on social media, I went back and forth with a couple of kids going back and forth. Because they were poppers, they were lockers, and I love popping and locking. Oh, yeah. Don't get me wrong. I, I, me and Shabadoo were close. You know, may he rest in peace. Boogaloo Shrimp. I know all these guys, all those guys. When we went to California in 82, 83, they were all outside waiting for us when the plane landed right. to welcome us. You know, they were all wonderful guys. And those were all the guys from the movie Breaking, right. who we also had a big part in the movie of. A lot of people don't know. 
Talk to me about the part that you had in Breaking. Okay, well, we were doing the show uh, with Don Cornelius. We were doing Soul Train. Okay. The producers and directors came to the to the studio. They pulled me aside, and they said, listen, we want to give the New York City Breakers eight to ten minutes segment in the movie Breaking. We had already we were already involved with Orion Pictures doing Beat Street. Breaking was Canon Pictures. So when they approached me with that, I'm like, okay, great, we're going to do it. Where do we sign? That's when Michael said, Chino, you can't do that. It's a conflict of interest. I didn't understand that, being a kid. I'm 17 years old. I'm going to be in two movies coming out at the same time? The first two movies coming out? How incredible would that be? You know, that's all I saw for me and my guys. Right. But we couldn't do it. Because, again, because of our contracts. So we actually had to turn it down. All right. And that's, see, that's another part of history that a lot of people don't know. If we were able to do that, again, the New York City Breakers would have been in the two first major motion picture breakdancing movies coming out at basically almost the same time. Because now it became a race right. on who was going to come out first. You know, Now, Breaking came out first, but Beach Street was a lot better. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. for sure. Now, Beach Street, you know, you're, you, you've got this performance, you know, on Beach Street, but you do this very memorable you know, renowned freeze, mm -hmm. you know, and that freeze is memorialized in a statue you were showing me. I was talk just about. honored. Talk to me about that. I was just honored for for that for that actual uh, dance scene. Um, last Thursday, Quick Step threw a big celebration for me, Theodore, DST, who's now called DXT. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm they, glad you cleared that because I was like, are these two dudes? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, 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 get, I actually asked them myself because I'm good friends with them. I'm like, I, your name is DST. He, he changed his name for personal reasons. Gotcha. And that's all he needed to say. So he's known as DXT now. So again, they honored all three of us. It was my pleasure to be there. I was so touched. And then to make these statues of all of us, they made one of him, one of me, and one of Theodore. And they were amazing, and they presented it to us. There were a lot of good people there, a lot of breakdancers, a lot of good people. It was a celebration for us. It was a, a memorial thing for Wild Style and for Beach Street, you know? Oh, and they also threw a little bit of Star Wars in there, too, the graffiti movie, Got you know? It. Yeah. Got it. But, um, and we, we just saw uh, Trap. Trap, yeah. You introduced me to him. That was awesome. <laughs> First time I met him in person. Yeah. Yeah, I knew all about him. I never got to meet him. He's like... Eight nine years old in Star Wars. I know man. he's a baby. Yeah, yeah, unbelievable. Thank God he's still here with us. And he just did a piece for us over at the Museum of Bronx History. That's, I know I saw it. It's beautiful. Keep that, bro. Put that thing away. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll figure it out. They're big four by eights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. So, talk to me about. I mean, you've had a great, great b boy career. Had nothing. I mean, you still have a great b boy career. <laughs> you know, um, just helping out now. <laughs> I hear you, but you're keeping it alive. Yes, trying you know? to. That's 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 my plan. And, and and we'll talk about the work you're doing with with B Boy London up in Yonkers in, 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 in a little bit, mm -hmm. then for sure. Okay. Right now, talk to me about the celebrities. You know that that you've met. You've named a lot of them, dude. For me, the biggest one was Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> well, we honored Reagan with a big picture of us. It's all over the internet. I mean, you can see it anywhere. Um, we had dinner at the White House. He invited us twice, actually. You know, I don't know any b-boy crew to do that. You, you didn't get McDonald's like no, Trump? No, there was no McDonald's. There was no <laughs> McDonald's. So, yeah, we're sitting at the White House with, with Reagan and all these top-notch celebrities, uh, a lot of them that are not with us anymore. Another thing that people don't really know about us, it's only been mentioned quite a few times, is that during the presidential inauguration, Frank Sinatra wrote me a letter. What? I still have it. Inviting us to perform at the show. So this was a special invitation for the New York City Breakers. Now, during that performance, all the celebrities that were there and that were a part of, of this extravaganza, this amazing thing for the president, was basically like charity. You know, everyone did it for free. It. You know, us being kids and not knowing any better, I said, we don't dance for free. <laughs> So Frank Sinatra, what is it that you guys want? You got. And we were the only ones paid to do the presidential inauguration for President Reagan and Bush. 
That's an awesome story. <laughs> and people, my mother was like, you got some, you know, <laughs> brass <laughs> ones on <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Again, being a kid, like, I'm like, well, I'm not going to give away my talent, you know, but that's another thing that Michael taught us. You know, being in the green room and being all these around these uh, celebrities, he says, you guys belong there. And he was right. We belonged there just as much as everyone that was there. And we were just as important as everyone that was there. I'm sitting with the Beach Boys, again, with Lou Ross, Linda Carter. We're all swapping stories, taking pictures. Delta, the, um, uh, the big uh, black lady from the TV show. She's in Harlem Nights. Yeah, I'm going to have to get back with you on that. Yeah. I just respect that. Yes. She's an awesome oh my God. artist. Yeah, I got a, f a brain fart. But, uh, yeah, I met her, and she wasn't a very nice lady, actually. She she wasn't nice to us for some reason. I don't know why. But anyway, that's that's how that's my memory of her. I right. wish I could remember her name. Um, but, um, again, you know, we belonged there. We, uh, we, were, we were superstars. We were B-boy superstars. I can sit here and say that. No other crew can say that. Sorry, guys. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, you were talking and you mentioned earlier about some of the work you're doing with B-Boy London and the New York City Breakers up at the Yonkers Board of Education. Is that right? Yes. Talk to us about that. Well, London Reyes, who's the CEO now of the New York City Breakers, I kind of gave him the reins. He's been running things for like the last 25 years and doing a hell of a job. I'm glad you cleared that up as the founder. Yes, doing a hell of a job and I'm very proud of him. Um, he's been working very closely with Mayor Spano from Yonkers of Westchester. Now we got a school program in the school district of Yonkers for kids. You know, um, it's free. You know, we've been working with the school district for quite a few years now. Um, trying to get more and more funding for the kids. Again, these are all free programs for the kids that have to do with hip-hop, breakdancing. If London was here, he can be a little more technical with exactly what's, what's going on. But all the events that we throw and stuff like that are usually in a lot of those, uh, schools because they give us the venue so that we can do this there, you know, for the kids and the community. You know, again, it's all about giving back. I, I firmly believe in that, you know. Um, and also about our legacy, you know. I, I, I want kids to, when they mention my name, the same way when I talk about my mentors, I want them to always remember how we tried to help, you know. Not only just being out there and doing the dance, and, and, but being also community activists and helping the community and helping the kids, you know, and teaching them right from wrong, you know? Yeah. Awesome, awesome. I know the last event I went to up in Yonkers was in a Montessori uh, school building. Yes, exactly. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. So awesome with everything you're doing for the youth, you and the New York City Breakers and B-Boy London Reyes. Appreciate it, brother. Thank, Thank you. you for keeping it alive. You know, uh, Kid Glide is doing, you know, a similar thing with He's the doing his breaking thing, right? league. Yep. My man King Uprock in Brooklyn does all his jams for a dollar. I give that man all the props. The all last, the, props. the last dollar jam he had, no one collected money. Really? From what I saw, it's like everyone went in for free. Good. And, and he still gave away gifts and prizes to the kids. And that's how it should be. And awesome. that's how it should be. Yeah. You yeah. Know, mm -hmm. Much, much respect, you know, for what's going on now. Yeah. And how you, you OGs are keeping it alive. Yeah, even even the competitions we throw where the you know the the the, the trophy and, and the money that these kids these kids it's all about giving back. We don't make any money off of it. This is all for them, you know, the prize money and everything. Everything that we collect and everything that, that helps us help them, you know, again, it's just for the, the community. Yeah. Right, right. You know, we're we're what, less than a month, you know, uh, with the 2024 Paris Summer Olympics behind us. Um, Breaking's big debut on the compet international competitive Olympic floor. Talk to me about what that means to you and Breaking. I, it means a lot to me. If anybody, if anybody knows, I, I think it means the most to me. Um, we finally made it. We were there. Did it go exactly the way it was supposed to go or how I wanted it to go? Not really. But I'm proud of all the athletes, you know. Um, I was a little embarrassed with that whole situation with the Australian breakdancer, you know, which we won't go into. I don't blame her. I blame the powers that be because she worked her way there, you know. Um, 
I've seen uh, videos of her. I think she's a wonderful woman. She's a very, she's an educator. You know, she went there. She went there. She did her best. You know, some people are saying that it was done intentionally to embarrass the culture and stuff like that. I don't think so. Again, we were there. The stage was there. We were there. You know, I think the scoring system could have been better. I really think that they should have involved uh, a lot of us. I think that's one of their weakest points, you know. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's still a lot of the, uh, you know, guys that are here, that are healthy, that are knowledgeable, that could have put a lot of insight and input into what went down and how it should have went down, you know. Uh, the music, again, could have been a lot better. Could have brought in a real serious DJ. You know, you got to remember that the kids dance to the music. So if the music's not right, you don't feel it. So again, not to take away anything from the athletes, I'm I'm especially proud of Victor, who I who I know and I met for bringing home the bronze for the USA. I'm so glad that that happened. You know, imagine us not meddling at all, wow. being the creators of this. You know, that would have been really embarrassing. But uh, he's he's our first uh, medalist, man, and he did a great job, and he held it down. I'm still proud of everyone and what went down because uh, like a good friend of mine, Mr. Freeze, told me, you can look at it one way or the other, you know? So I choose to look at it in a positive way. You know, we were there, it happened. Is it gonna be in the 2028 Olympics? I don't think so. They're already saying it's not. But I know in my heart that if this was done correctly and if this was done right and powerful, they would have had no choice but to bring it back. Right. I know that for a fact. Because the people would have wanted it back. But because of things that happen and things not being correct, right. I could understand they're not being back. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you think about, you know, and I, w watching the, the Olympics and mo most of the finals, um, you know, what, what did you think about the focus just being on breaking power moves? And I, I, I don't know about the focus, but I'll, there wasn't a lot of respect given to uprocking. Um, obviously, it's Olympics and it's just breaking. B boying is bigger, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and I know poppers are not b boys; they're right. they're boogiers, but they're all part of that street dance culture. Right. You know that many b boy crews, many rocking crews had rockers. They had breakers. You know, they had poppers. Well, that's what made a whole crew is having a little bit of everything, right? Exactly. Yeah. What, what's your opinion about? The Olympics only focusing on power moves. I, I don't think they were basically focused on power moves. I uh -huh. think they were just focused on breaking itself. You know, you got to remember again that breaking is the is the forefront. Breaking is the one who broke down all the doors. Breaking is the one who traveled overseas and planted the seed. It was breaking. It wasn't boogie boys. It wasn't poppers. It wasn't lockers. Again, my respect to all the lockers, Lockertron John, Shabadoo, all those guys from the 60s and 70s. Again, Fred Berry, who I met personally before he passed away. He was a, one of the original lockers. What's happening? Yes, yes. And, and, and an incredible dancer in his own right. But again, it was just focused on breaking. It is what it is, you know. Mm -hmm. um, well said, well said. I think the scoring system was a little off because I think an overall b-boy should be able to do everything. Your up rocking has to be on point. Your footwork has to be on point. Your spins, your power, your freeze definitely gotta be on point. Right. I really didn't see a lot of hard freezes. Right. And a freeze to me is something that's boom. You understand what I'm right. saying? And I think that's what I gave in the movie Beat Street that everyone loves to this day. They played my scene in the, in the ceremony they had for me last Thursday. And all you see me is flying around, especially people that don't understand. And all of a sudden, it just stops and you see me in a pose. Right. Again, that's called the freeze, right? I, obviously. But I didn't see a lot of that. I didn't see a lot of that. You know, there was a lot of elements that weren't there. You're right. You know, and a lot of, you know, you know what I do see a lot too, which I don't understand. And we did it also in battles. A lot of joking around. You know, a lot of the joking and the disrespect and making fun of each other. Right. Yeah, that's a part of it. But when you're in an Olympic competition, you better go out there and give it your best. There's no time to joke around. There's no time to, you know, oh, you know what? That was weak. I'm better than you. Because the guys that they were dancing against each other, when one was performing, the other one in the background was making gestures. Mm -hmm. And now they're making that a part of the breaking. I just saw now, now there's hand gestures that you do. 
Right, right, right. Dividing. Yeah, I'm yeah, like. I, I saw that. I'm like, wait, wait a minute. Where, where, where did that come from? You know, they, yeah, you want to say someone bit your move, you just say it. You know, there's no gestures and hand movements and what are we in baseball? You know, like, <laughs> you know, again, you know, like there was just a lot of things that sh it, it, listen, it, it is it is what it is. Yeah. You know, what one one of the uh, U.S. breakers that I think didn't get the attention or recognition that she deserves for me was B-Girl Logistics. I totally agree with that. You know, because yeah. you're talking about yeah. she was she was hitting those freezes. Yeah. She was hitting those B-Girl stances yeah. at the end. What you got? Yeah. You know, so much respect yeah. to her, you know, for, you know. Let me tell you, to see these females, <laughs> these females today are better than most of the guys from my day. You know, it's incredible. Um, what I still don't see with the females, and again, it's just my opinion, I still don't see that very raw power, you know. Um, I think that's still missing, and I think it also has to do, you know, just because we're men, maybe the men are powerful more, a little stronger. Uh, again, I'm not trying to, you know, sure. be a male, male chauvinist or anything. But, um, yeah, they were amazing. It's just that I, they were very slow. And, you know, my girlfriend, who's not even a dancer, doesn't know anything about breakdancing, when she, we were watching her, she was like, are they moving in slow motion? <laughs> You know, yeah. you know, breaking is fast. Yeah, it is really fast. Is. So that was also missing. Even with the guys, I mean, they were fast, but they could have been faster. You know, to me, I love speed, right. and that's what I was known for. My footwork was fast. My spins were fast. My windmills were fast. Action. That's it. it says it all. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Is 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 there anything we we haven't spoke about that 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 you'd like to speak about? I just want people to, um, again, remember your history. You know, a lot of us are still around. I'm very approachable. You know, everybody that's following me on Instagram, on Facebook, any questions, feel free to message me at any time. Um, anything that anyone is doing that wants us involved, we're here. That's why we're here. You know, we want to help. You know what I'm saying? We want to make sure that this is done right. We want to pass the torch, you know. Um, my move that I created and I did in the movie B Street, which is a back no hand swipe into a spin pop up into windmills, as I started to travel around the world, I went to different countries and kids were coming up to me. Oh my God, I love that coin drop. I'm like, what? What? What's that? That move you did in the movie, that's not a coin drop. So this is another thing that we need to do. You know, and to me it's important. To me it's important. There are certain names and certain moves that were created and that's the name. Right. So, you know, kids are trying to change that now. And they're making up all these weird names and all of this and that. You know, <laughs> the, it, the wheel's already been invented. You can't change it. Right. You know, it's already done. You know, so let's keep it real. If you don't know the name of a move, you know, and you want to know, reach out to one of us. It's simple. That's all. Right. Yeah. What's, what's the future of b-boying, breaking? I, I think it's only the beginning. I think this thing is going to evolve. I, I think this thing is is going to get nothing but better. I mean, uh, I, I met this kid named Nugent from Brazil, who to me is amazing. This kid is unbelievable. But he also has a background. He reminds me of me when I was a kid. He also has a background in capoeira. He also has a background in martial arts. He also has a background in gymnastics. I just seen him in a new martial arts movie. And he's fighting, breakdancing, fighting. It's incredible, you know? So again, the breakdancing, listen, I think it's just the beginning. This is nowhere near the end. I think doors are just gonna start opening up for these kids because there's nothing that we can't do. There's nothing that we can't do. There's a commercial that Montefiore just put out and it's really emotional. That's my story. That, About breaking, yes. Dude, that commercial, you have no idea. When I saw the poster. And it's a new one. Yes. Um, about finding out on, on time. Yes. Uh, uh, what's the what's the slogan? I, I you know, mm. don't recall, oh but God. Jesus, Montefiore, the the hospital, cancer has, commercial, Einstein, right? Montefiore, yes. Einstein, yes, has a commercial with b boying Unbelievable! I can't believe that in what was that? Two minutes? Yes. Two and a half minutes. They got it right. The footage, yes. Dude, it's amazing. The whole way practicing. Yes. The kid watching the kid. That's me and Noel. Growing up, being on the trains, going to the club, battling, the church, the way they were dressed. It was unbelievable. 
that's another thing that my girlfriend said to me. Um, Michelle, thank you. Love you, baby. Um, she goes, you know what I noticed, babe? When you were, when you were dancing and all the kids today, there's no un there's no uniforms, there's no unity. It's all about everybody for themselves. You guys were crews, you know. Right. Now, yeah, there are crews because you see in Red Bull competition, I seen crews against crews, but these kids are like, you don't know who's who. They're going out with regular clothes. You don't know who's battling. You don't know who's with who. You don't know what's going on. That commercial right there. That's biblical. If that doesn't show you the essence of b-boying in that commercial, and then look what the commercial is about, cancer. How serious is that? How important is b-boying if they're making a cancer commercial using b-boys? Think about that. That's right. Think about that. Okay? That commercial sums it up right there. But look at that commercial. These kids so they can learn from that. The unity, the kids, the way they're together, the way they're dressed, when they're showing their names on their shirts, how proud they are. You know, you don't see that anymore. And it's a shame. It's a shame, you know? Yes. But again, I think b-boying is just it's just starting. It's just starting. It's going to be here even when we're gone, brother. It's still going to be here and going strong. You see? I guarantee you that. That's awesome, man. You're, I, I appreciate, you know, all your words, man. Thank you so much. Um, You're welcome, brother. You know, a little personal, but... How has b-boying changed your life? Oh my God, dramatically, man. It took me out of the streets. This, it's crazy because if it wasn't for the dance, I probably wouldn't be here. I, listen, I wouldn't be here. I know I wouldn't be here. You know, there were a lot of kids that, would, again, that we left behind that, you know, didn't evolve with us, didn't practice, didn't want to get any better. And I lost a lot of friends on the way, you know? They're not even with us anymore. You know, they went in a different direction. This opened up a lot of doors for me. Opened up a lot of doors. I mean, even when I stopped dancing, I, I helped with music videos. You know, I, I, I directed uh, uh, school films. You know, I, I helped kids from NYU with certain projects that they were doing. Like, it just opened so many doors because I didn't want to just be a break dancer, a b-boy. Yeah, that's what got me there. But I wanted to learn everything. I wanted to learn what's behind the camera, what's this, the writing, the this, the that. You know, so I'm, I'm getting more and more involved with that. You know, now everyone is asking me to write a memoir or to write a book, you know. And I'm, I'm thinking about it. I'm looking into some people, you know, that, that has, uh, that are into the business of writing and stuff like that. Because I don't know how to write a book, right. you know. But so I'm definitely going to need help with that. But I'm looking into that. But I'm definitely going to do that because within the last 10 years, <laughs> you, you won't believe all the people that... You have to write a book because this is only 2% of, of this interview of, of what's going on and what's happened in my life right. and in the hip-hop culture. You know, not just me, just me being a part of that and a small part. Yeah. You know, I mean, a small these, part. These interviews are just a little bit of yeah. documenting that history, yeah. going back yeah. and capturing you, the breakers, the b-boys, the yeah. street dancers, the poppers, you know, capturing that history. Yeah. But, you know... A, Another way of capturing that history, you know, is, is what you guys are doing now. You know, continue to keep it alive, man. You guys and listen, this. I I want to I want to thank you so much for your you, even your past videos that you've done with other people. I think they're incredible. Um, you're doing the right thing. You're also helping out with the culture and the hip hop, you know, community. And you know, we got to stick together in this, man. You know, I, I, in, in in strength, in numbers, there's strength. You know, so as long as we stick together. Yeah, you I know, respect everyone. Religion, color, I don't care. If your windmills are better than mine, they're better than mine. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> we like to end all our oral history interviews by one quite with one question. What does the Bronx mean to you? Heart and soul, family. Right there. Awesome. Awesome. You can take the the, the, the kid out of the Bronx, but you can't take the Bronx out of the kid. <laughs> Chino Action Lopez. That's right, brother. Awesome. New York City Breakers. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for everything. Thank I appreciate you. appreciate you. Peace, my brother. Peace to you.